My favorite person in the scriptures, besides Jesus, uh, besides Jesus, is Caleb, because he's always described as wholehearted. When the 12 spies were to go into the promised land, they were spied out to see what's there. A 10 came back and they said, we can't go in there. It's too, it's too much. The, there's giants in the land. The people that inhabit the promised land, they're just too big, too numerous. We, we, we can't do it. But there was two that came back. In light of that negative report, there's two that came back with a positive report. And that was Joshua and Caleb. And they said, we can take it. We can see the promises of God get fulfilled because we have the presence of God with us. And what God has set out to do, no, nobody can stop. Nobody can thwart. So we're going to follow the Lord. And Caleb is always described as wholehearted. Uh, and so that's why he's, he's my favorite Bible character person in the scriptures because of that term wholehearted. I mean, who doesn't want to be like wholehearted? Uh, and my kids know this. Uh, my daughter... Her senior year at uh, Valor Christian, uh, she, in ceramics class, made me this mug. And on the bottom of it, it says, because he followed the Lord wholeheartedly. Wholeheartedly. And I just pray, man, that, that, that would be for us, that we would be a community and a congregation that would follow the Lord wholeheartedly. Because what Caleb and Joshua found out is the gap between what we experience and the fulfillment of God's promises in our life. What fills that gap is following the Lord wholeheartedly. God's given us promises. He's given us promises in his word. So to fill that gap from what we experience to what God has promised in his word is a life of wholehearted discipleship in Jesus. In fact, we will not be measured as a church by the quantity of our membership, but the quality of our disciples. We could have great music. We could have great preaching. We could have great whatever. We could have great programs, new foyer, lobby, great things. But we will not be measured by those things ultimately. We will not be measured by the number of people that come to church. We will not be measured on the quantity, but the quality of the disciples here. That's how we will be evaluated. So we talk about wholehearted in this series. What we're, what we're referring to is wholehearted worship, wholehearted formation, and wholehearted mission. Wholehearted disciples that are going after the things of God. And that's what we want to be about. And we talked about last week the vision that we feel like the Lord is calling us into. We laid out three objectives. And listen, without wholehearted discipleship, those three objectives are just, they're vanity. The first one of, you know, seeing a beautiful lobby happen. I mean, um, beautiful lobby, beautiful playground. But if, but if we're not wholehearted disciples in Jesus, that's just going to be a shell. Talked about you know, coming together in these roundtable meetings, cultivate gatherings, where we're going to get to know one another, be known and know one another. We can know each other really, really well in the community, but if we're not wholehearted disciples in Jesus, that's just a social club. The last was raising up next generation leaders through the Three Streams Institute. Leaders that are characterized by rooted in the gospel, alive in the spirit, formed by the liturgy. But if we're not a church of wholehearted disciples of Jesus, we won't raise up wholehearted leaders for the next generation. So what all of this hinges on, I told you last week that this week we're going to understand what our place in all of this is. And this is our place, is to be wholehearted disciples of Jesus. Because the gap, the gap, the way that gap gets closed between what we experience currently and the promises of God that he's given us in his word is wholehearted. So these next three weeks, we're going to be looking at wholehearted worship, wholehearted formation, and then wholehearted mission. So today, wholehearted worship. Before we look at this passage, John 4, let's pray. Lord, we bring to you all the places in our hearts that are half-hearted. Lord, we confess to you those things that we've chased after thinking that they would provide something that only you can provide. So, Lord, we just cast all of, all of our concerns, all of our worries, all of our idols at the feet of Jesus, that we will once again, as the people of God, recommit with wholeheartedness our love and devotion to you, Jesus. May your word settle upon our hearts. Change us, transform us. By the power of your name, Jesus, we pray. Amen. In order for us to be able to respond wholeheartedly in worship, there's something that precedes that. Because worship is always our response to God's gracious initiation. And so what we're going to see in this passage is the invitation and the confrontation that Jesus gives to the woman at the well. But Jesus, God, initiates the whole thing. 
And to the extent that we see God's initiation, we'll be able to understand our response. So first, what is God's wholehearted initiation, his wholehearted pursuit? It's for, the first aspect is found in verses 4 through 9. Now he had to go, that is Jesus, through Samaria. So he came to a town in Samaria called Sychar, near the plot of ground Jacob had given to his son Joseph. Jacob's well was there, and Jesus, tired as he was from the journey, sat down by the well. It was about noon. When a Samaritan woman came to draw water, Jesus said to her, Will you give me a drink? His disciples had gone into the town to buy food. The Samaritan woman said to him, You are a Jew, and I am a Samaritan woman. How can you ask me for a drink? For Jews do not associate with Samaritans. And in this passage, Jesus crosses three significant boundaries. Socioethnic boundary, number one. Gender boundary, number two. Moral boundary, number three. And this is significant because the extent of his crossing the boundary speaks to his wholehearted pursuit in love towards this woman. The first, the, going across the boundary of socio-ethnicity. She is a Samaritan. He is a Jew. And it's hard to put into words the animosity that these two peoples experienced. I mean, it's like thousands and thousands of years. It probably goes back all the way to Joseph. Joseph, you know, one of the sons of Jacob, he did not go into the promised land, but his two sons did inherit um, a portion of the promised land, Ephraim and Manasseh. And in fact, they inherited the lion's share of the promised land. If you if just Google this, you will see that they take up a tremendous amount of territory as compared to the other tribes. Furthermore, the land that they inherited was the best. It was the most fruitful, most abundant. And so there's probably jealousy already like gathering up in the hearts of the people, you know, thousands of years before. Furthermore, that when the kingdoms divided after Solomon, you had the northern kingdom of Israel and the southern kingdom of Judah. When the northern kingdom, whose capital was Samaria, next to it was Shechem, by which it was in the vicinity of the well, when they were conquered by the Assyrians, the way that the Assyrians conquered was not only militarily, but also culturally and religiously. So when they came into the land, they exiled some of the Jews, but the other Jews that remained, they enmeshed themselves within the Assyrian culture, the Assyrian sociological dynamics, their religious practices. So when the Jews returned, what they found is not pure Jews who are worshiping the one true God, but something very different. And so the Jewish people looked at those who are now called Samaritans as compromisers, traitors. Furthermore, when Judah was trying to rebuild the walls, it was the opposition that came against him that came from uh, the Samaritans. Furthermore, when Alexander the Greek came onto the scene in AD, what, the fourth century BC, he came in and he established Samaria as his... Um, not capital, but his base in which he could control the Jews. So therefore, creating greater hostility and enmity. So much so that when in 128 BC, the Jewish people went into Mount Gerizim, destroyed the Samaritan temple. The Samaritans retaliated a few years before Jesus came onto the scene by taking the bones of dead people, going into the temple on the eve of the Passover and spreading it all over the Passover, rendering the temple undefiled, defiled, um, impure, so they could not carry out the Passover. So there's just tremendous hostility. And again, it's hard to put into words the enmity, the animosity, and the hatred between these two. And you begin to see a little bit of it in Luke chapter 9, when they're trying to pass through Samaria, and the Samaritans won't let them through. And the disciples turn to Jesus, and they say, should we call down fire from heaven? <laughs> like, what? Like, what are you talking about? And yet it's, it's into this setting, into this context, that Jesus runs in, and he meets a Samaritan. And not just a Samaritan, but a Samaritan woman. And he meets her in an uninhabitable place, something that a male would never do in that culture at that time. In fact, Kenneth Bailey, who's been living in the Middle East for 40 years, over 40 years, he said that he would never see, has never seen a man do what Jesus did to a woman in an unhabitable place. It would be unheard of. So he not only crosses over a socio-ethnic boundary, but also a gender boundary. But third, she's not just a woman. She's a woman with a reputation. 
Most of the time, women would go to the well in the morning, you know, when it's the cool of the day. They would gather up the water for the day, but not this woman. Why? Why does she go at the noonday? The women gathered together at the well. They would always do so first thing in the morning, and it became like kind of a, a cultural, social kind of community experience with the women. And the only reason that a woman would go midday at the heat of the day to go to the well to get water is because she has been shamed and shunned by society. She has a reputation. And it's into this that Jesus breaks through all three barriers. There is no profile of a person that could be further away from Jesus. But notice what Jesus does. Here is the Son of God. He's the creator of the world. All things were created by him, for him, and through him. All things are for him. All things are under his feet for the church. He has supreme authority. He created all. And yet Jesus comes hungry, he comes thirsty, he comes in a place of need. He comes to the will, not even having anything to draw water from. He's thirsty, and he comes in a place of weakness. Now notice what he does to the woman. Affirming her dignity, affirming her honor, he doesn't come in a place of power over her. He comes empowering her, needing something from her. He lifts her up dignifies her, honors her, asking her for something that he doesn't have. She's the lowest of the low in society at that time. And even though she is the lowest of the low, Jesus goes lower still. What love, (laughs) what beauty, what passion, what pursuit He goes all of this way to dignify her, honor her, pursue her, intentionally giving everything to her. Why? Wholehearted pursuit of our God in love towards the least, the last, and the lost. That's the power of Jesus. Wholehearted love pursuing this one that society has shunned. Wholehearted love. Now notice, in Jesus' loving pursuit, He not only gives her a grace-filled invitation, but he also gives her a truth-filled confrontation. Look at verse 13 through 18. Jesus answered, Everyone who drinks this water will be thirsty again, but whoever drinks the water that I give them will never thirst. Indeed, the water I give them will become in them a spring of water welling up to eternal life. And by the way, that's the passage that wellspring comes from. We want to be a wellspring of eternal life bubbling up from within us. The woman said to him, verse 15, Sir, give me this water so that I won't get thirsty and have to keep coming back to draw water. He told her, go call your husband and come back. I have no husband, she replied. Jesus said to her, you are right when you say you have no husband. The fact is that you have had five husbands, and the man you now have is not your husband. What you have just said is quite true. Now, what Jesus does is is he confronts her. But he does so by comparing the water that comes from the well with the water that he provides, the well well of everlasting life. In essence, what he's saying is if you continue to go back to this well, if you continue to draw from, in order to fulfill the, the, the deepest longings of your heart, the things that this world offers, you will always lack fulfillment and you will always lack satisfaction because the things of this world do not ultimately satisfy And when we continue to run after the things of this world to provide for us things that only God can provide, we will always find ourselves wanting. Because this world, it's not enough. We have eternity in our hearts. And that space can only be filled by God. But Jesus confronts her. He says, this is what you're hiding in your heart. And when we read this, we're like, geez, back off a little bit, Jesus. I mean, let's go back to the love part. But he confronts her. He confronts her in love just as he invites her in love. And he recognizes and he calls out within her where she has gone to broken cisterns. Jeremiah chapter 2 says, My people have committed two sins. They have forsaken me, the spring of living water, and have dug their own cisterns, broken cisterns that cannot hold water. The longings of our heart aren't met in God. We will run to other places. C.S. Lewis talks about the sweet poison of the false infinite. Things have this word, they're sweet. And if we look 
for them to provide something that is built within us that only has infinite capacity. It is sweet poison, and it is false infinite. It's something that only God can provide, and we do it all the time. I mean, and we know this. I mean, I've never, I've never met an alcoholic that said, you know, I just, I just had a bottle of Chardonnay last week, and um, I'm good. I don't need any, I don't, I don't, I don't thirst for anything else. Like, I, I don't need another bottle. I don't need another drink. I'm good. I've never met a shopaholic that went on a shopping spree that just ended all shopping sprees. They go to Park Meadows and they just spend thousands upon thousands upon thousands of dollars on things that they really don't need. They don't come back and say, I'm good now. I will never have to go to Park Meadows again or order anything on Amazon. Like, I'm fine. I feel completely satisfied and fulfilled all the way down to the deepest parts of my soul. I've never met anybody who's just involved in serial hookup after hookup after hookup, continually like swiping right on Tinder, come back after a weekend of just like whatever, and then just come back and say, I just feel so fulfilled. I'm never going to look for another relationship again. I just feel so satisfied. That fulfilled the deepest longings of my heart. Never heard any of that. Why? Because we continue to run after those things ultimately, and they do not satisfy. David Foster Wallace, he says uh, in his address to some college students, if you worship money and things, if they are where you tap real meaning in life, then you will never have enough. Never feel you have enough. It's the truth. Worship your own body and beauty and sexual allure, and you will always feel ugly. And when your time and age start showing, you will die a million deaths before they finally plant you. Worship power. You will feel weak and afraid. You will need ever more power over others to keep the fear at bay. Worship your intellect being seen as smart. You will end up feeling stupid, a fraud, always on the verge of being found out, and so on. (laughs) So true. G.K. Beale says when people revere, what people revere is what they will resemble either for ruin or restoration. And if we worship anything that are created, it will be for our ruin. It will destroy us. We will become the things that we worship. And if we worship the stuff, it will take us and place us in the ditch. So, this is what Jesus does. He wholeheartedly pursues us, not only with grace-filled invitation, but also truth-filled confrontation. And he does so out of love. Oh, the love of our Savior, to not leave us in our sin. Oh, the love of our Savior, not just to settle with with followers who have broken cisterns, but to restore us and to renew us. That's the loving pursuit of our Heavenly Father. So we have to see that first, and then we have the perspective to see the response that God is inviting us into, and that is wholehearted worship. And you see it in the woman at the well, verse 24 through, 20, 19 through 24 is all about worship. Worship gets repeated like 10 times, and it's speaking to the response of the woman. And then it gets to verse 24 and says, God is spirit. His worshipers must worship him in spirit and in truth. Now, in Ephesians, to be filled with God means to be filled with the Spirit. In Colossians, that same line, to be filled with God, it means to be filled with His Word, with His Word. So which is it, be filled with His Spirit or to be filled with His Word? What does it mean to have the presence of God in you? Jesus says, yes. To be filled with His presence is to be filled with the Spirit, to be filled with His Word. And that makes all the difference in the world. A.W. Tozer says, Throughout the history of humanity, there have been many great discoveries, and I'm not sure which one I would point to and say, that is the greatest discovery in the world. But for the hungry of heart, there is but one discovery that satisfies it, the discovery of the manifest conscious presence of God. The presence of God changes us. When we worship, we worship the manifest presence of God, and we want it here. We want him here. We want him here, and we want him here manifest presence of God. And then this whole passage culminates into verse 26. Then Jesus declared, I, I, the one speaking to you, am he. That is the Christ. And in the Greek, in the original language, it's not I am he. It's just simply I am. I am, which is the declaration of who God is and how he reveals himself in the Old Testament. Jesus is the great I am. So when we are looking for the presence of the Lord, Jesus says, I am the temple. When we are confused, Jesus says, I am the one way, the one truth, and the one life. 
When we are anxious, Jesus says, I am the peace that passes all comprehension. To those that are li living in despair, Jesus says, I am the resurrection and the life. To those that are living in darkness, Jesus says, I am the light. To the hurting, he says, I am your healer. To the broken and enslaved, Jesus says, I am the redeemer. To those that are weary and burdened, Jesus says, I am the yoke that is easy, and I am the burden that is light. Jesus is the great I am. And notice her response. Notice her response. In verse 29, she tells the rest of the town. She goes back and she says, come see a man who told me everything that I did. Could this be the Messiah? She, she just unleashes, like, all the deep secrets of her heart to the town. Come and see the man who told me everything about me. You know, all of my sin, all of my brokenness. And then what Craig Keener observes in this passage is that the entire passage moves from, like, very general to very specific. It starts off with sir. Then it goes to Jewish man. Then to prophet. Then to Messiah. And finally, in verse 42, to Jesus being the Savior of the world. And in this passage, we see the response of what it means to be wholehearted in our worship. Wholehearted. It means to bring everything out into the light and to put Jesus at the center. <clears throat> bring everything out into the light. It's the opposite of the world. That world says you've got to hide your stuff and you've got to put yourself at the center. Jesus says, no, you put me at the center. I am the Savior of the world. And bring out into the open everything that's inside of you. Almighty God, to you all hearts are open, all desires known. And from you, What? No secrets are hid. Come see a man who told me everything about me. Put him in the center. And there's a distinction between, in our culture, narcissism that puts ourselves in the center, seeking that if we put ourselves in the center, our life in the middle, that we will get life. But what Jesus says, if you put your life in the middle, you don't gain life, you actually lose life. Jackie Hill Perry, in a podcast I was listening to, actually it was an Instagram video, and she threw down on it. She makes a distinction between like narcissism and true worship. Notice. Now, this is an observation and kind of a quote of that Instagram video. Jackie Hill Perry. And if you know Jackie Hill Perry, God brought her out from some stuff. This is what she says. There's a kind of narcissistic, self-centered, self-oriented worship, self-oriented worship hermeneutic that has been imposed on every biblical text that has, been extract, that has extracted self-denial, death to self, mind renewal, holiness, love of neighbor, and love of God. And into the text has been imposed that everything is about me. It's my season, my purpose, my marriage, my day. It's just my, my, my. And the thing is, we love that kind of teaching because we love ourselves. We've forgotten the reality that we were made for God, that everything exists for God, for his value, his glory, his worship. And one of the sneaky pieces of self-love is that we actually love ourselves and simultaneously hate ourselves. If you know anything about narcissism, the root of narcissism is shame. So narcissists create a false self to overcompensate for the self-loathing and believing some lie that we're not valuable that we don't have dignity, and God forbid we've been mistreated or abused, where it has confirmed or compounded the shame that we already feel. So we then listen to a teacher who will flatter us because we think if they gas us enough, maybe we'll feel better about ourselves. If they just talk about us enough, maybe we will feel good about ourselves. So we think that their flattery will restore our dignity instead of going to the text and saying that if I am made in the image of God, it means that I am somebody, but here's the gag. If you don't have a solid theology of nature of God, then you won't even find value in being made in God's image. Do you see what she's saying? And our attempt to put self at the center in order to get dignity and honor, what we're actually doing is being motivated by a place of shame. We're creating a false self. We don't gain self, but we actually lose self. But Jesus says, if you lose self, put me in the middle, and you recognize that Jesus is ultimate, and ascribe ultimate worth to the one who's ultimately worthy, then we have dignity and value because we've been recognizing that we are created in the image of that great and glorious God. And that great and glorious God saw us worthy enough to redeem us through his death on the cross. Oh, what great love the Father has lavished on us. <laughs> and that reality only comes through wholehearted worship. Come see a man who told me everything that I've ever done. Let's worship him. Let's worship him. So good. 
So the response for us here this morning is maybe twofold. First, if you're, if you're coming here and you recognize that you've just been half-hearted in your worship, half-hearted in your devotion to Jesus, maybe it's time, during, maybe it's time to recommit your life to Jesus. I'm tired of playing around, just Jesus on the fringes. Jesus the center, wholehearted, pursuing him, everything for him. Secondly, maybe you're hiding sin. There's things that you've just covered up. Maybe the invitation for you is just like, let's give it all to Jesus. Because he not only wants to invite us, but to confront us with the things that are holding us back from a greater relationship with him, with more life in him. So if that's you, man, we're, we're, we're just going to, I'd encourage you to go back during the communion time just to receive prayer. But here's the invitation for us. No longer half-hearted worship. Bring everything into the light. Because in wholehearted worship, what we get is all of the promises, and it closes the gap from what we experience to the promises of God that are offered to us. Abundant life in him, not only in eternity, but now. Now. So now, let's have a baptism. Cynthia, come on up.